From August 1962 to September 1969, the Beatles had a lineup that consisted of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr. Their breakup was a cumulative process attributed to numerous factors. These include the strain of the Beatlemania phenomenon, the death of manager Brian Epstein in 1967, resentment towards McCartney from his bandmates for his perceived domineering role, Lennon's heroin use and his relationship with Yoko Ono, Harrison's increasingly prolific songwriter output, the floundering of Apple Corps and the Get Back Project as well as managerial disputes. During the latter half of the 1960s, the members began to assert individual artistic agendas. Their disunity became most evident on the Beatles, and quarrels and disharmony over musical matters soon permeated their business discussions. Starr left the group for two weeks during the White Album sessions, and Harrison quit for five days during the Get Back rehearsals. Starting in 1969, the group split into two camps regarding who should handle their business affairs. McCartney lobbied for entertainment lawyers Lee and John Eastman, but was outvoted by his bandmates in favor of businessman Alan Klein. The final time that the four members recorded together collectively was the session for Abbey Road's closing track The End on August 18, 1969. Lennon privately informed his bandmates that he was leaving the Beatles on September 20, although it was unclear to the other members whether his departure was permanent. On April 10, 1970, McCartney issued a press release that stated he was no longer working with the group, which sparked a widespread media reaction and worsened the tensions between him and his bandmates. Legal disputes continued long after his announcement, and the dissolution was not formalized until December 29, 1974. Rumors of a full-fledged reunion persisted throughout the 1970s, as the members occasionally reunited for collaboration, but never with all four simultaneously. Stars I'm the Greatest and Harrison's All Those Years Ago are the only tracks that feature three ex-Beatles. After Lennon's murder in 1980, the surviving members reunited for the Anthology Project in 1994, using the unfinished Lennon demos Free as a Bird and Real Love as the basis for new songs recorded and released as the Beatles. History 1956-1963, Formation The Quarrymen and Name Changes Early Residencies and UK Popularity First Emmy Recordings 1963-1966, Beatlemania and Touring Years I Please Please Me Slash I and I with the Beatles Slash I None First Visit to the United States and the British Invasion I a Hard Day's Night Slash I. None. 1964 World Tour, Meeting Bob Dylan, and Stand on Civil Rights. I Beatles for Sale Slash I, I Help, Slash I and I Rubber Soul Slash I. None. Controversies, I Revolver Slash I and Final Tour. None. 1966-1970, Studio Years. I Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band Slash I None I Magical Mystery Tour Slash I and I Yellow Submarine Slash I None India Retreat, Apple Core, and the White Album I Abbey Road Slash I, I Let It Be Slash I and Separation None 1970 Present, After the Breakup 1970s 1980s 1990s 2000s 2010s 2020s Musical style and development In Icons of Rock, an encyclopedia of the legends who changed music forever, Scott Skinder and Andy Schwartz describe the Beatles' musical evolution. In their initial incarnation as cheerful, wise-cracking mop tops, the Fab Four revolutionized the sound, style, and attitude of popular music and opened rock and roll's doors to a tidal wave of British rock acts. 
their initial impact would have been enough to establish the Beatles as one of their era's most influential cultural forces, but they didn't stop there. Although their initial style was a highly original, irresistibly catchy synthesis of early American rock and roll and R&B, the Beatles spent the rest of the 1960s expanding rock's stylistic frontiers, consistently staking out new musical territory on each release. The band's increasingly sophisticated experimentation encompassed a variety of genres, including folk rock, country, psychedelia, and baroque pop, without sacrificing the effortless mass appeal of their early work. In The Beatles as Musicians Walter Everett describes Lennon and McCartney's contrasting motivations and approaches to composition, McCartney may be said to have constantly developed as a means to entertain a focused musical talent with an ear for counterpoint and other aspects of craft in the demonstration of a universally agreed-upon common language that he did much to enrich. Conversely, Lennon's mature music is best appreciated as the daring product of a largely unconscious, searching but undisciplined artistic sensibility. Ian MacDonald describes McCartney as a natural melody ist a creator of tunes capable of existing apart from their harmony. His melody lines are characterized as primarily vertical, employing wide, consonant intervals which express his extrovert energy and optimism. Conversely, Lennon's sedentary, Ironic personality is reflected in a horizontal approach featuring minimal, dissonant intervals and repetitive melodies which rely on their harmonic accompaniment for interest, basically a realist, he instinctively kept his melodies close to the rhythms and cadences of speech, coloring his lyrics with bluesy tone and harmony rather than creating tunes that made striking shapes of their own. MacDonald praises Harrison's lead guitar work for the role his characterful lines and textural colorings play in supporting Lennon and McCartney's parts, and describes Starr as the father of modern pop-slash-rock drumming. Influences The Beatles' earliest influences include Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins, Little Richard, and Chuck Berry. During the Beatles' CEO residency with Little Richard at the Star Club in Hamburg, from April to May 1962, he advised them on the proper technique for performing his songs. Of Presley, Lennon said, Nothing really affected me until I heard Elvis. If there hadn't been Elvis, there would not have been the Beatles. Other early influences include Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, Roy Orbison, and the Everly Brothers. The Beatles continued to absorb influences long after their initial success often finding new musical and lyrical avenues by listening to their contemporaries, including Bob Dylan, The Who, Frank Zappa, The Love and Spoonful, The Birds, and The Beach Boys, whose 1966 album Pet Sounds amazed and inspired McCartney. Referring to The Beach Boys' creative leader, Martin later stated, No one made a greater impact on the Beatles than Brian. Ravi Shankar with whom Harrison studied for six weeks in India in late 1966, had a significant effect on his musical development during the band's later years. Genres Originating as a skiffle group, the Beatles quickly embraced 1950s rock and roll and helped pioneer the Merzabeat genre, and their repertoire ultimately expanded to include a broad variety of pop music. Reflecting the range of styles they explored, Lennon said of Beatles for Sale, you could call our new one a Beatles country and western LP, while Gould credits Rubber Soul as the instrument by which legions of folk music enthusiasts were coaxed into the camp of pop. Although the 1965 song Yesterday was not the first pop record to employ orchestral strings, it marked the group's first recorded use of classical music elements. Gould observes, the more traditional sound of strings allowed for a fresh appreciation of their talent as composers by listeners who were otherwise allergic to the din of drums and electric guitars. They continued to experiment with string arrangements to various effect, Sgt. Pepper's She's Leaving Home, for instance, is cast in the mould of a sentimental Victorian ballad, Gould writes, 
its words and music filled with the clichés of musical melodrama. The band's stylistic range expanded in another direction with their 1966 B-side Rain, described by Martin Strong as the first overtly psychedelic Beatles record. Other psychedelic numbers followed, such as Tomorrow Never Knows, Strawberry Fields Forever, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and I Am the Walrus. The influence of Indian classical music was evident in Harrison's The Inner Light, Love You to End Within You Without You Gould describes the latter two as attempts to replicate the raga form in miniature. Innovation was the most striking feature of their creative evolution, according to music historian and pianist Michael Campbell, A Day in the Life encapsulates the art and achievement of the Beatles as well as any single track can. It highlights key features of their music the sound imagination, the persistence of tuneful melody, and the close coordination between words and music. It represents a new category of song more sophisticated than pop, and uniquely innovative. There literally had never before been a song classical or vernacular that had blended so many disparate elements so imaginatively. Philosophy professor Bruce Ellis Benson agrees, The Beatles, give us a wonderful example of how such far-ranging influences as Celtic music, rhythm, and blues, and country and western could be put together in a new way. Author Dominic Pedler describes the way they crossed musical styles, far from moving sequentially from one genre to another the group maintained in parallel their mastery of the traditional, catchy chart hit while simultaneously forging rock and dabbling with a wide range of peripheral influences from country to vaudeville. One of these threads was their take on folk music, which would form such essential groundwork for their later collisions with Indian music and philosophy. As the personal relationships between the band members grew increasingly strained, their individual tastes became more apparent. The minimalistic cover artwork for the White Album contrasted with the complexity and diversity of its music, which encompassed Lennon's Revolution 9. Star's country song Don't Pass Me By, Harrison's rock ballad While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and the proto-metal roar of McCartney's Helter Skelter. Contribution of George Martin George Martin's close involvement in his role as producer made him one of the leading candidates for the informal title of the fifth Beatle. He applied his classical musical training in various ways and functioned as an informal music teacher to the progressing songwriters, according to Gould. Martin suggested to a skeptical McCartney that the arrangement of yesterday should feature a string quartet accompaniment, thereby introducing the Beatles to a hitherto unsuspected world of classical instrumental color, in McDonald's description. Their creative development was also facilitated by Martin's willingness to experiment in response to their suggestions such as adding something Baroque to a particular recording. In addition to scoring orchestral arrangements for recordings, Martin often performed on them, playing instruments including piano, organ, and brass. Collaborating with Lennon and McCartney required Martin to adapt to their different approaches to songwriter and recording. MacDonald comments, while worked more naturally with the conventionally articulate McCartney, the challenge of catering to Lennon's intuitive approach generally spurred him to his more original arrangements, of which being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, is an outstanding example. Martin said of the two composers' distinct songwriter styles and his stabilizing influence. Compared with Paul's songs, all of which seemed to keep in some sort of touch with reality, John's had a psychedelic, almost mystical quality. John's imagery is one of the best things about his work Tangerine Trees, Marmalade Skies, Cellophane Flowers. I always saw him as an oral Salvador Dali, rather than some drug-ridden record artist. On the other hand, I would be stupid to pretend that drugs didn't figure quite heavily in the Beatles' lives at that time, they knew that I, in my school masterly role, didn't approve. Not only was I not into it myself, I couldn't see the need for it, and there's no doubt that, if I too had been on dope, Pepper would never have been the album it was. Perhaps it was the combination of dope and no dope that worked, who knows. Harrison echoed Martin's description of his stabilizing role, 
I think we just grew through those years together, him as the straight man and us as the loonies, but he was always there for us to interpret our madness we used to be slightly avant-garde on certain days of the week, and he would be there as the anchor person, to communicate that through the engineers and onto the tape. In the studio Making innovative use of technology while expanding the possibilities of recorded music the Beatles urged experimentation by Martin and his recording engineers. Seeking ways to put chance occurrences to creative use, accidental guitar feedback, a resonating glass bottle, a tape loaded the wrong way round so that it played backwards any of these might be incorporated into their music. Their desire to create new sounds on every new recording, combined with Martin's arranging abilities and the studio expertise of Emmy staff engineers Norman Smith, Ken Townsend, and Jeff Emmerich, all contributed significantly to their records from Rubber Soul and, especially, Revolver Onwards. Along with innovative studio techniques such as sound effects, unconventional microphone placements, tape loops, double tracking and very speed recording, the Beatles augmented their songs with instruments that were unconventional in rock music at the time. These included string and brass ensembles as well as Indian instruments such as the sitar in Norwegian wood and the swarm mandal in Strawberry Fields Forever. They also used novel electronic instruments such as the Mellotron, with which McCartney supplied the flute voices on the Strawberry Fields Forever intro, and the claviolin, an electronic keyboard that created the unusual oboe-like sound on Baby. You're a Rich Man Legacy Former Rolling Stone associate editor Robert Greenfield compared the Beatles to Picasso, as artists who broke through the constraints of their time period to come up with something that was unique and original, and the form of popular music, no one will ever be more revolutionary, more creative, and more distinctive. The British poet Philip Larkin described their work as an enchanting and intoxicating hybrid of Negro rock and roll with their own adolescent romanticism, and the first advance in popular music since the war. The Beatles' 1964 arrival in the U.S. is credited with initiating the album era. The music historian Joel Whitburn says that LP sales soon exploded and eventually outpaced the sales and releases of singles in the music industry. They not only sparked the British invasion of the U.S., they became a globally influential phenomenon as well. From the 1920s, the U.S. had dominated popular entertainment culture throughout much of the world, via Hollywood films, jazz, the music of Broadway and Tin Pan Alley and, later, the rock and roll that first emerged in Memphis, Tennessee. The Beatles are regarded as British cultural icons with young adults from abroad naming the band among a group of people whom they most associated with UK culture. Their musical innovations and commercial success inspired musicians worldwide. Many artists have acknowledged the Beatles' influence and enjoyed chart success with covers of their songs. On radio, their arrival marked the beginning of a new era. In 1968 the program director of New York's WABC radio station forbade his DJs from playing any pre-Beatles music, marking the defining line of what would be considered oldies on American radio. They helped to redefine the album as something more than just a few hits padded out with filler, and they were primary innovators of the modern music video. The Shea Stadium show with which they opened their 1965 North American tour attracted an estimated 55,600 people, then the largest audience in concert history, Spitz describes the event as a major breakthrough, a giant step toward reshaping the concert business. Emulation of their clothing and especially their hairstyles, which became a mark of rebellion, had a global impact on fashion. According to Gould, the Beatles changed the way people listened to popular music and experienced its role in their lives. From what began as the Beatlemania fad, the group's popularity grew into what was seen as an embodiment of socio-cultural movements of the decade. As icons of the 1960s counterculture, Gould continues, they became a catalyst for bohemianism and activism in various social and political arenas, fueling movements such as women's liberation, gay liberation, and environmentalism. 
According to Peter Lavezzoli, after the more popular than Jesus controversy in 1966, the Beatles felt considerable pressure to say the right things and began a concerted effort to spread a message of wisdom and higher consciousness. Other commentators such as Michael Gilmore and Todd Leopold have traced the inception of their socio-cultural impact earlier, interpreting even the Beatlemania period, particularly on their first visit to the U.S., as a key moment in the development of generational awareness. Referring to their appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show Leopold states, In many ways, the Sullivan appearance marked the beginning of a cultural revolution. The Beatles were like aliens dropped into the United States of 1964. According to Gilmore, Elvis Presley had shown us how rebellion could be fashioned into eye-opening style, the Beatles were showing us how style could have the impact of cultural revelation or at least how a pop vision might be forged into an unimpeachable consensus. Established in 2009, Global Beatles Day is an annual holiday on June 25 each year that honors and celebrates the ideals of the Beatles. The date was chosen to commemorate the date the group participated in the BBC program Our World in 1967. Performing All You Need Is Love broadcast to an international audience. Awards and Achievements In 1965, Queen Elizabeth II appointed Lennon, McCartney, Harrison and star members of the Order of the British Empire. The Beatles won the 1971 Academy Award for Best Original Song Score for the film Let It Be. The recipients of seven Grammy Awards and 15 Ivor Novello Awards, the Beatles have six diamond albums, as well as 20 multi-platinum albums, 16 platinum albums and six gold albums in the US. In the UK, the Beatles have four multi-platinum albums, four platinum albums, eight gold albums and one silver album. They were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1988. The best-selling band in history the Beatles have sold more than 600 million units as of 2012. From 1991 to 2009 the Beatles have sold 57 million albums in United States according to Nielsen SoundScan. They have had more number one albums on the UK charts, 15, and sold more singles in the UK, 21.9 million, than any other act. In 2004, Rolling Stone ranked the Beatles as the most significant and influential rock music artists of the last 50 years. They ranked number one on Billboard magazine's list of the all-time most successful Hot 100 artists, released in 2008 to celebrate the U.S. Singles Chart's 50th anniversary. As of 2017, they hold the record for most number one hits on the Billboard Hot 100, with 20. The Recording Industry Association of America certifies that the Beatles have sold 183 million units in the U.S., more than any other artist. They were collectively included in Time magazine's compilation of the 20th century's 100 most influential people. In 2014, they received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. On January 16 each year, beginning in 2001, People celebrate World Beatles Day under UNESCO. This date has direct relation to the opening of the Cavern Club in 1957. In 2007, the Beatles became the first band to feature on a series of UK postage stamps issued by the Royal Mail. Personnel Timeline Discography The Beatles have a core catalogue consisting of 13 studio albums and one compilation. Song Catalog Through 1969, the Beatles' catalog was published almost exclusively by Northern Songs Ltd., a company formed in February 1963 by music publisher Dick James specifically for Lennon and McCartney, though it later acquired songs by other artists. The company was organized with James and his partner, Emmanuel Silver, owning a controlling interest variously described as 51% or 50% plus one share. McCartney had 20%.
reports again very concerning Lennon's portion 19 or 20 percent and Brian Epstein's 9 or 10 percent which he received in lieu of a 25 percent band management fee. In 1965, the company went public. Five million shares were created, of which the original principals retained 3.75 million. James and Silver each received 937,500 shares, Lennon and McCartney each received 750,000 shares, and Epstein's management company, NEMS Enterprises, received 375,000 shares. Of the 1.25 million shares put up for sale, Harrison and Starr each acquired 40,000. At the time of the stock offering, Lennon and McCartney renewed their three-year publishing contracts, binding them to Northern Songs until 1973. Harrison created Harris Songs to represent his Beatles compositions, but signed a three-year contract with Northern Songs that gave it the copyright to his work through March 1968, which included Taxman and Within You Without You. The songs on which Starr received CO writing credit before 1968, such as What Goes On and Flying, were also Northern Songs copyrights. Harrison did not renew his contract with Northern Songs when it ended, signing instead with Apple Publishing while retaining the copyright to his work from that point on. Harrison thus owns the rights to his later Beatles songs such as While My Guitar Gently Weeps and Something. That year, as well, Starr created Startling Music which holds the rights to his Beatles compositions, Don't Pass Me By and Octopus's Garden. In March 1969, James arranged to sell his and his partner's shares of Northern Songs to the British broadcasting company Associated Television, founded by impresario Lou Grade, without first informing the Beatles. The band then made a bid to gain a controlling interest by attempting to work out a deal with a consortium of London brokerage firms that had accumulated a 14% holding. The deal collapsed over the objections of Lennon, who declared, I'm sick of being fucked about by men in suits sitting on their fat arses in the city. By the end of May, ATV had acquired a majority stake in Northern Songs, controlling nearly the entire Lennon-McCartney catalogue as well as any future material until 1973. In frustration, Lennon and McCartney sold their shares to ATV in late October 1969. In 1981, financial losses by ATV's parent company, Associated Communications Corporation, led it to attempt to sell its music division. According to authors Brian Southall and Rupert Perry, Grade contacted McCartney, offering ATV Music and Northern Songs for $30 million. According to an account McCartney gave in 1995, he met with Grade and explained he was interested solely in the Northern Songs catalog if Grade were ever willing to separate off that portion of ATV Music. Soon afterwards, Grade offered to sell him Northern Songs for £20 million, giving the ex beatle a week or so to decide. By McCartney's account, he and Ono countered with a £5 million bid that was rejected. According to reports at the time, Grade refused to separate Northern Songs and turned down an offer of £21.25 million from McCartney and Ono for Northern Songs. In 1982, ACC was acquired in a takeover by Australian business magnate Robert Holmes Accord for £60 million. In 1985, Michael Jackson purchased ATV for a reported $47.5 million. The acquisition gave him control over the publishing rights to more than 200 Beatles songs, as well as 40,000 other copyrights. In 1995, in a deal that earned him a reported $110 million, Jackson merged his music publishing business with Sony, creating a new company, Sony ATV Music Publishing in which he held a 50% stake. The merger made the new company, then valued at over half a billion dollars, the third largest music publisher in the world. In 2016, 
Sony acquired Jackson's share of Sony slash ATV from the Jackson estate for $750 million. Despite the lack of publishing rights to most of their songs, Lennon's estate and McCartney continue to receive their respective shares of the writer's royalties, which together are 3313% of total commercial proceeds in the U.S. and which vary elsewhere around the world between 50 and 55%. Two of Lennon and McCartney's earliest songs Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You were published by an Emmy subsidiary, Ardmore and Beechwood, before they signed with James. McCartney acquired their publishing rights from Ardmore in 1978, and they are the only two Beatles songs owned by McCartney's company MPL Communications. On January 18, 2017, McCartney filed a suit in the United States District Court against Sony slash ATV Music Publishing seeking to reclaim ownership of his share of the Lennon-McCartney song catalog beginning in 2018. Under U.S. copyright law, for works published before 1978 the author can reclaim copyrights assigned to a publisher after 56 years. McCartney and Sony agreed to a confidential settlement in June 2017. Selected Filmography Fictionalized A Hard Day's Night Help Magical Mystery Tour Yellow Submarine Documentaries and Filmed Performances The Beatles at Shea Stadium Let It Be The Complete Beatles It Was Twenty Years Ago Today The Beatles Anthology The Beatles, One Plus The Beatles 8 Days a Week The Beatles, Get Back Concert Tours See also Grammy Award Records Most Grammys Won by a Group Notes References